uh, which is about uh, a city as an innovation lab. Um, I would like, of course, to uh, thank the audience and all the speakers, in particular our moderator today, uh, Nathalie Goury from uh, EuroCities. And of course, I would like to, to congratulate uh, the Vice Mayor of the City of Nantes, Mr. Bassem Assé, for winning the iCapital uh, Prize, which is a, a very fierce competition uh, between European cities. So congratulations. Um, I would like also to thank the chair of the high-level uh, expert group on innovating cities. Innovating cities uh, for um, the report they are about to deliver. The participants in this session would uh, uh, have already received a very uh, final draft report uh, of this uh, very interesting report. Um, I would like uh, also to um, uh, deliver. Um, some messages. We are just going out of a very interesting session, which was uh, World Cafe uh, uh, on um, the uh, city's uh, mission. It was a very interesting experience with uh, 150 persons exchanging what are uh, the topics, the challenge, and what are uh, the ways uh, or the good practices as to uh, the uh, citizens' engagement. So. This was uh, a very interesting uh, element, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, this session also uh, will be uh, quite uh, interesting. So first of all, I will uh, give the floor immediately to Professor Ricardo, um, um, Ricardo Crescenzi uh, for a keynote uh, speech. Professor? Uh, my name is Riccardo Crescenzi from the London School of Economics, and I have the pleasure to act as the rapporteur for the high-level expert group on uh, innovating cities. And what I will do today, I, I know that uh, some of the colleagues who worked on the report are also present here, so I hope I will be able to do full justice to the depth and breadth uh, of the report. Uh, I was delighted to see that many of the issues that are covered in the report have been also discussed earlier today in the World Cafe. Many of the issues are then presented in the report in a systematic way, and I hope the report will offer uh, food for further conversations uh, around these uh, uh, key topics. Um, I I'm not sure you can see the slides because they from, I, I thought they were going to be projected here, but uh, in this talk, in this very uh, short talk, I will touch three key points. Uh, the first point will be about the challenges. So the, the point that I will make is that uh, uh, Europe uh, is facing, uh, uh, thank you, is facing unprecedented challenges, uh, and, and so are uh, European cities. And I will argue that cities can be labs to solve uh, or to look at the solutions for some of these problems. And I will briefly discuss how the report uh, is proposing a possible way forward to look at these challenges in a systematic way, to link them to cities and try to see how cities that are often the source of the problems we have discussed can also be the labs where the solutions are designed and thought about. So, like, like I mentioned before, like very briefly, I don't think this is like needed uh, in this audience, but Europe is facing uh, new challenges. Um, climate change and the sustainability model of European development is our model of economic, social, spatial development, sustainable. Uh, we are facing unprecedented problems in terms of uh, social fragmentation. And we have seen how this is leading to rising tensions that are also reflected in electoral outcomes very often. Uh, we are also dealing with a major problem in terms of employment. I was quite surprised that this didn't come up uh, in, in the conversation, the issue of employment, the issue of to what extent people can have decent jobs uh, to enjoy uh, uh, livable and, and, and sustainable cities and how this links with artificial intelligence and the future of work, the extent to which we can deal with diversity and, and migration. 
the extent to which the, the global uh, changing political landscape and uh, global shifts in technologies are changing the way in which Europe can function uh, as a union in the first instance, and the extent to which new and emerging political tensions uh, are questioning the value added of Europe. Is there a value added of being together, of being a union? So we need to prove to EU citizens that there is a value added coming from, from Europe. So these global challenges, in a certain sense, impact cities and are impacted by cities because they shape the forces that, in their turn, shape the urban environment. The, the, the global challenges that I mentioned before create risk and uncertainty for cities and for citizens, and therefore shape their behavior and shape the way in which they can organize their lives. They shape agglomeration effects, the extent to which cities can stay together and grow, or the extent to which some cities might be shrinking because they are not economically sustainable anymore. Or the link between cities and the rest. Okay, we, make, we discuss a lot about cities, but what about the rest? What about the non-urban environment? What about rural areas? What about other spaces that are connected to urban environments? And this also affects global local linkages. Okay, cities are not only about what happens locally, but are also nodes of global connectivity, of things that happen globally. Think about investment flows, think about migration flows. So we need to think about cities also as nodes of global networks. So what happens very far away, what happens in Brazil, impacts what happens in European cities, uh, uh, somewhere in the periphery of Europe as well as in the center of Europe. So cities are interconnected through global nodes. And the same is true for how the digitizing world is impacting urban life. So the global challenges are linked to urban challenges. And so here is where innovative cities step in. Okay. This is where cities can deal with global challenges and help find the solutions to these challenges. So we need to understand cities, and I think this emerged very nicely in the debate we had before. Cities should be understood as complex metabolism that attract people, that attract economic activities, resources, opportunities, and innovation. Uh, and in cities, it is where, and in their functional neighborhoods, so it's not only about the urban center, it's also about all other areas that are functionally connected to cities, it's where global challenges become real. It's where people feel problems on their skins, where they face the global challenges that I mentioned before on their uh, daily lives. So cities are, can be the laboratories where, we, where this problem becomes more acute, but also where we can think about solutions. And they can become the multipliers, they can become the catalysts, where we can look for the solutions for some of the problems that often are of their own making, that are generated by the fact that we live in cities and we live in cities more and more. So cities can be catalysts to enable transformation. And so the priority of thinking about cities should be to think about how innovation in cities can address global challenges. So thinking about innovative cities is thinking about innovative solutions. So to address global challenges, cities need to be inclusive. Cities need to be safe, resilient and sustainable. This is what SDG 11 is all about. But cities can also actively support the achievement of all other sustainable development goals. If we think of cities as labs where global challenges can be addressed in innovative ways, then we see as cities are not only about SDG 11, but they become part of the solution and become a means to address all other SDGs. So how? how? Well, we need to understand what cities really are, and this is something that we state very clearly at the beginning of our report. We try to offer some sort of a conceptualization of how we think about cities in a broader sense. We need to identify tangible directions of action. So from this diagnosis, from how we understand cities, we need to see, okay, how can we move forward? And we also need to address some fundamental knowledge gaps. So when thinking about cities, we realized, okay, there is a, a lot that we know, but there is also a lot that we don't know about cities and their functioning and their future. And that's where research and innovation actions step in. They are about the unknown. They are about understanding new things, solving problems about cities and understanding how research and 
and, and innovation, and I like to stress research, can help addressing a ch the challenges that cities are facing. And hence, the, the human-centered city. So the way in which our expert group has been thinking about this set of problems here is thinking about a city as something that should be centered around human beings. Hence, the human-centered city. And the human-centered city is, can be organized, the way in which we have been thinking about a human-centered city is organized around four key dimensions. People, places, prosperity and resilience. And these three key dimensions are joined together by two cross-cutting dimensions. A dimension that has to do with governance, something that has been extensively mentioned before, something that links all the dimensions, and measurement, the issue of data, the issue of knowledge, understanding what is going on in different cities, and be able to measure and evaluate all actions, thinking about their impact. And all this should be achieved through a systemic approach, not by working in silos, by looking at these dimensions in isolation, but by linking them and seeing the city, as I mentioned before, as a living system. Uh, there is really no time, so this is just a teaser for the full report that I hope you will have the chance to read, download, comment upon, and interact with us as an expert group uh, to foster a conversation. So like I mentioned before, there were four key dimensions, people, that is about making the most of diversity and social inclusion. This deals really with the social dimension, with how people live in cities and interact in cities, and how their diversity uh, and the diversity of their interactions shapes urban life. Place is about the more uh, hardware of the city, and really this with planning within planetary boundaries, with renewables and energy efficiency at its core. It covers a lot about the decarbonization of systems in, uh, in, in cities, and thinks about smart mobility services, creating a built environment that works for people. <coughs> Prosperity uh, uh, deals more with uh, economic aspects of, of cities and how we can make the achievement of sustainability in city economically and financially viable. How we can think about the problem of generating income, of generating jobs, and in generating high-quality jobs that become part of a fulfilling, high-level quality of life uh, in cities. But also how we can deal with uh, uh, diversities in opportunities, and in particular when it comes to economic opportunities. Resilience, finally, establishes how the foundation for building resilience in cities can be created by looking at all the other dimensions that I mentioned before. So resilience is not only understood in technical terms, but also has to do with uh, social resilience and economic resilience. So links, uh, uh, resilience links uh, the way in which we think of cities at 360 uh, degrees. Like I mentioned before, these dimensions need to be linked. So we had two key cross-cutting uh, themes. Governance, so good governance, a well-functioning governance at the city level is fundamental to achieve the objectives uh, highlighted in all other dimensions uh, of the human-centered city, and it cannot be decoupled for measurement. We need knowledge to enforce action and to make sure action is uh, evidence-based and is driven by knowledge uh, about what citizens are doing. And this also involves issues of ownership of data, management of data, and sharing uh, of data about uh, citizens and their cities. So very briefly, uh, just a final teaser about the recommendations uh, of the report. So uh, uh, let's move into the, into the action. What, what is the action that the report is, is proposing as a way forward in terms of research and innovation actions? Um, so the, 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 the key principles of the uh, integrated research and innovation actions are putting citizens at the very center, uh, the human-centered cities, and make sure citizens should always be at the center of research and innovation actions, but actions should not target one single dimension individually. Each action should tackle one, two or more of the dimensions that we mentioned within the framework of good governance, measurement, and evaluation. This is the key like, methodology that we propose to think about research and innovation actions in cities. The final like, step 
some examples of the recommendations in the report that you will find uh, when reading the, the, the report is about ensuring technological development, especially uh, uh, the, the digital part of this is human-centered and not technology-driven, so the needs of citizens are driving uh, uh, the way in which we think about the digital world and the digital city. Recoupled, often decoupled uh, agendas, the social, the economic, the environmental agenda, so bring them together in a fully integrated fashion. Focus on affordability in order to maintain mixity and diversity in city and make it sustainable, make it a strength, a social and economic strength and political strength for cities. And finally, uh, recognize that cities are nodes of global networks, so that cities are uh, important nodes of flows of skills, of knowledge, of capital, of information, and that these, no, these, net, these links can ultimately create and generate value to citizens. Um, everything I mentioned, and much more, uh, like, I, like I said, it's a, a titanic endeavor to try and summarize such a huge, rich uh, report, uh, you will find uh, in the final uh, version of the report that we hope uh, will be circulated uh, very soon for you to read and uh, comment upon. Uh, I look forward to your questions, uh, comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Professor Krecenzi. Now, immediately, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Uh, Jürgen uh, Rüdgers, University of Bonn, and also advisor to uh, Commissioner for Research and Innovation. So please take the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to say some remarks, and perhaps it is a little bit uh, also from the opposition side to that, uh, what we heard. You know that uh, since the beginning of this century, Europe experienced significant deindustrialization. The results were recession, low econo economic growth rates, a high level of unemployment, especially of youth unemployment, while at the same time technical progress developed at a rapid pace. As a consequence, in many European countries, society experienced a division between old and young, local residents and immigrants, the people and the elite, right wing and left wing, center and periphery, somewheres and anywhere. That is why needs Europe a higher growth, a growth that is smart, sustainable and inclusive, because 80% of economic growth in the European Union is the result of an increase in product productivity. We have not overcome the division of civil society despite good, good economic performance. The reason that many people are afraid of the future, of losing their jobs, of too many new and strange things. When divisions in a society are getting too deep, democracy is geopardist. The level behind are rebelling against the affiliated. The exodus from the rural areas does not only deteriorate the social situation in the peripherals, but also the urban and semi-urban areas. In France, for instance, two-thirds of households below the poverty line live in these urban and suburban areas. While the average income in these areas is usually higher 
but per choosing power is lower and public service expensive. The densification strategy of increasing housing construction, which is being discussed everywhere in the big and prosperous middle class cities, also splits society. This does not only apply the rundown suburbs. The debate about the densification of inner cities and the outer districts leads to violent political conflicts. The urban stress symptom of the present is network densification and urban expansion. This separation of living and working in city and country must be overcome. The digital world is making this possible again. After the industrial world had separate boats due to pollution and traffic. Anyone, of, anyone who wants unity and diversity like the European Union must stay away from a uniform architecture and from making metropoles and l'Europe profonde semi. Behind the concept of smart city is thus in the Silicon Valley world the attempt to privatize municipal services and abolish communal democracy. The way to achieve this leads through the use of public and private data to forge profitable alliance with the other powerful strip pullers in the cities, which mean real estate developers or industrial investors. Such a city might be smart. However, it is by no means sustainable and inclusive. So it is time to start to social political discussion on how we want to live in the future. Specifically, if we cannot say which jobs will be dropped and which new ones will emerge. If we cannot explain how the resilience of our society can be strengthened, how to functionally of the essential services of general interests like energy and water, waste deposition, fire brigade, healthcare, traffic, and so on, can be ensured, then we cannot follow the attractive slogans of the Silicon Valley industry. No system is sustainable that is not resilient. Anyone digitizing everything must also explain the sustainable solutions he used to save the climate. He also to explain how digital services of general interest work how the energy needed for the computers are provided, and what happens when the supercomputers fail during power outages. That is need is an alternative for the European city, which is not totally supervised by computers, monopoles, companies, and bureaucracies and then controlled by outsiders. No, every part of our lives has to be discussed, data-driven, and though of by a neoliberal side of optimization, as in the US. Also, our cities should not to be the object of a total surveillance of citizens, such as the party dictatorship in China is organized. The UN prognosis does not take to into account the structure and the culture that has arisen 
in, the, in thousands of years in Europe. It is a prognosis of technocrats. Europe does not want, Europe does not need uniform cities. It needs, not, it needs new ideas, courage for the future, research and technology, knowledge and innovation in cities and rural areas where people like to live. For rural areas too, the digital world, which already includes the many villages, communities and middle-sized cities, offers many new opportunities. Again, there are no silver bullets. Every community and village must find their own way, not against the cities, but with the citizens. The, the Im imagination knows no limits. If you want to preserve the European way of life in the 21 century, if you want to live in a human society which is fair, in which freedom is a supreme good, if which uni unity in diversity is possible without uncontrolled machines, echo chambers, political, economies, manipulations in state, economy and civil society, then we must now make our society dependent on anonymous data, inscrutable algorithms, anonymous power centers. Europe's alternative is the European including the political and economic culture, not as a museum or tourist event. Europe's star is its culture and the lived clarity about the cultural form and cultural essence of the modern world. We must defend our European way of life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rutgers. Um, so, we are starting to build uh, the, the panel now. I would like to, to call two ladies on stage, Nathalie Goury from Eurocities, as well as um, Dr. Margit Knoll from uh, Austria Research Promotion Agency and also chair of the GPI Urban Europe Management Board. Please, on stage. And last but not least, the winner, the winner of the iCapital Award, representing Nantes, Mr. Bassem Asse. So please. So we had, can you hear me? Can I have the mic, please? Great. So I'm sure that after those great two keynote speeches, you have plenty of questions. But please park them, note them on a paper, and that we will take them at the end of the session. It's for the question of you know, timing. We only have an hour, so we have to be strict on the timing. And we have a throwing mic. You don't have to be afraid at all. If you have a question, then you will be able to ask it at the end. So after those two distinguished speakers that we had, we will move to uh, you know, the last part of our session with Dr. Dr. Margit Knoll. As uh, uh, Mr. Aginaga said, Margit represents here the JPI, so the Joint Programming Initiative Urban Europe for the management board of this initiative. And Margit, could you please tell us how integrated approaches can help to achieve a more people-centered, so more human-centered urban development? Yeah, that works. Okay, thank you. And, and thank you also for the, for, for the inputs, which are really inspirational in a way that they cover so many different aspects. So the question is, is quite a tough one, right? Um, I, would, I, I think this, this integrated approach that is put forward is something that, that is called for since, since a while, right? So this is nothing new that cities call for. We need a new approach in governance, in, in the management of cities. Still, we are not there yet. 
and and uh, in our program we we fully agree and, and buy into to the report and the various aspects that the high level expert group has has raised as key challenges and as requirements for future research and innovation uh, we also spent some thoughts on how can we really deal with that and how can we mobilize all these actors so one of the one of the reasons maybe why we are not there yet with integrated approaches is that if you look on, on the various ambitions that you have, on the various strategies to deal with all the issues that you raised in your presentation, uh, starting by uh, the urban dimension in the sustainable development goals, you will soon recognize that some of them uh, are conflicting. Right? There, are, there might be a set of competing targets and ambitions and, and anyone you know, working in a city council, I think, uh, knows that, that you have to deal on a daily basis basis with those conflicting issues. But I think that's the issue that we need to be aware of in order to, to cater for the diversity of needs in the city, in, the, in your people chapter. I think you need to deal with the different interests of those diversity. Right? Uh, when we try to, to deal with the transformation of our urban infrastructure and transforming that, putting all the high-tech solutions in them, are they still affordable? Right? Does that lead to inclusive uh, urban neighborhoods? So I think all these developments and opportunities that we see, the strategies, result some way or the other in, in a sort of conflict by interests of the different stakeholders or by competing strategies. And this is something that we really put, would like to Put an, put an eye on, put the finger on. So in our strategy that, that we have launched recently, uh, we have identified a set of those, we call it dilemmas, of those conflicts where we think policy, urban policy needs to keep an eye on. Without addressing those critical issues, we don't achieve sort of any serious sustainable ambition. And, and of course that is in line with an integrated approach and trying to get there. And this does not only mean that we need to act cross-sectoral or cross-disciplinary, uh, it also means that we need to act in, in a multi-stakeholder engagement way, that we need to uh, act in a, in a multi-governance concept, right? So the, to buy people in and to let them participate and join, and I think this was one of the key issues of the session before, how can we engage the people? So what we use in, and what our experience is in, in, in our research and innovation program, uh, we are facilitating and, and supporting um, local experimentation and co-creation. We call that urban living labs in a way that uh, science policy is cooperating. That's what citizens are involved in different ways. That we use a very specific local issue as, as the starting point for research and innovation, to really create the impact in the cities and ensure that the various interests are met. And of course, when, which puts a lot of emphasis on the neighborhood level. I think you mentioned that also, right? This is where people are brought in. This is their personal um, engagement in the context where they are living. So this neighborhood skill might be really important to, to use as an entry point for such integrated approaches, most likely. Then it's easily, uh, the question easily comes up, so what's the next? How can we translate those local results to a more citywide implementation? How can we bring these local experimentation projects into a daily business in city councils? And there are very nice examples around in our European cities, but I think we are not there yet to understand how this translates. Into, into new governance procedures, into new mechanism, how, how cities are, are planned, designed, made, put into, into reality. So in, in that sense, we, the, the last thing that, that I would like to raise here is that in order to do so, we, we see that capacity building is something that is widely needed on all ends, right? We need to adapt our research system so that researchers are more into really going local, co-creating um, on, on ensuring a level playing field with citizens or with uh, city administration. Now this goes back to the city administration itself and public authorities to be able to, uh, to change their roles maybe from administration to moderation uh, in order to run those processes, not keeping things open and, and, and when you have a co-creation process you 
it's a different kind of risk that you're taking, right? So how can we build these capacities that, that also city administration is able to deal with that? And of course, then it's education on, on the city side in a way that they really engage, that they know how to game the play, play the game in, in the tools that might be there. And, and digitalization has been mentioned as one of the key issues facilitating that. So in that sense, looking into integrated approaches, we see the need of, of redefining our research questions so that we can anticipate the, the critical policy issues. Uh, not only maybe the single track, but where different interests across and, and how we can deal with that. And facilitating new ways of research and innovation that that's better supports the participation of cities and citizens. In a way, this has a lot to deal with the conditions that we put forward in our calls and in our programs. And of course, then how we support the capacity building, sharing, communicating, increasing the impact of all these investments. So that, that's basically my experience in our program and also reflecting some of the ambitions that we have along the same lines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margit. I think that you did a great job responding to this complex question in a clear and concise way. So I think that we can <laughs> applaud Margit. And now our last but not least speaker is Mr. Bassem Asse, who is Vice Mayor of Nantes. You're in charge of citizen or civic dialogue, and you're the fresh winner, as it's been said, of the European Capital of Innovation, the I Capital Award. So congratulations to you. Before we give the floor to you, we will show a short video about the work of Nantes on this, you know, capital of innovation. So please, if you can run the video. That's there. Okay. So, Mr. Asse, could you please tell us which initiatives have really transformed your city in a lab for innovation? And more especially, what was the role of citizens? Thank you. Thank you for your question and thank you for your time. First, we are very honored to become the new uh, capital of innovation of Europe for the year 2019. Um, I guess most of you remember that back in 1990, for example, or 1991, people thought that we were reaching the end of history because people thought that liberal democracy had won the Cold War and that democracy was implemented and that it was here to stay forever. And now, a few years, a few decades after, we are all aware that democracy is not acquired once and for all that it's a battle of every day and you need to learn how to keep it, how to practice it, and it's not easy every day. And we know that democracy is being deconsolidated in some parts of the world. And our role as, on, on our level, very humble level, this, the level of cities, this is where 75% of Europeans live. That's what I read in, in, in the presentation of your report. Um, on our level, we need to, of course, be believers in democracy, but also practitioners of democracy in order to keep it, to keep it, and maybe even to improve it and consolidate it. So uh, when it comes to innovation, innovation is a very, um, very interesting word because you can innovate in many areas, in many domains, bringing new solutions to new challenges, to new problems. So for us, 
innovating when it comes to democracy is something very important because democracy in 2019, 2020 is not facing the same challenges as when it appeared back in the 18th century, as 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 it was as it was facing challenges in the in the 80s or in the 90s. So to new challenges, we need to innovate and find new solutions. And for us in Nantes, we are uh, using what we call civic dialogue as part of this new way of answering new challenges. So we talk about civic dialogue rather than participatory democracy, for example, the other word that could fit, because we want people to participate, and in order for them to participate, they need to understand what we are talking about. When you use the word democracy, usually you think about a ballot, a box, a bulletin that you put and you vote and that's it. Whereas participatory democracy needs a bit more than that from you as a citizen. It needs you to participate in a dialogue, to participate in a debate in order to analyze a problem, understand the problem, understand the challenges, understand the opportunities, help solve that problem and implement new solutions. And that civic dialogue for us is between three stakeholders and this is part of the innovation. Of course, the citizens, all of them, wherever they come from, they are inhabitants of our city and they are citizens of our city, even if they were born in another country, etc. Citizens first, elected officials, of course, because they are responsible of what is being done or not done sometimes. And also the civil servants, because they will be implementing the projects in most of the times. So this civic dialogue for us is very important in order to be innovative. And we have two objectives of that. First is increase the efficiency of our public policies. That's one. And the second one is also something that you mentioned in your report, and that is consolidate the social bonding between people. Make sure that the people are talking to each other. And given the world that we are living in, it's already a good step forward if people talk to each other. Of course, they will not always be uh, agreeing on the solutions to the issues. Sometimes they don't even agree on the issues. But we need them to talk to each other because when we are confronting point of views, this is how we can innovate and imagine new solutions. If you put in the room people who think exactly the same thing, they will bring the same problem on the table and most likely the same solution. If you put people who are very different from each other, this is where innovation comes from. I think someone, the commissioner this morning, talked about the diversity of point of views, and I'm insisting diversity of point of views. This is where the innovation will come from because we are confronting ideas and bringing new ideas to those new solutions, and most of the time they are very, very tough solutions. So that's the theoretical part of it. A few, a few, a few illustrations, a few, a few success stories, if I may use that, that expression. Uh, for example, when it comes to energy transition, energy transition is clearly a challenge of the, maybe even the challenge, or at least one of the two main challenges of, 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 uh, of this century. Energy transition for us, wasn't something that you can decide uh, up there and make it happen down there. It was something that needed to be both top down and bottom up. It needed to be articulated. Someone needed to give the, the, the to initiate the, 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 the workforce, to initiate the collaboration, but you also needed people who are involved in energy transition and also people who are absolutely not involved in, in energy transition to give their ideas to say what they think about that, how, how they feel things, how they feel that we can resolve, uh, sorry, how they feel that we can solve that problem. So, for example, in that great debate that we did around energy transition, we had 50,000 contributors. Sometimes contributors were just commenting uh, a, a document. Sometimes contributors were just participating to a conference, raising awareness, that's, that's important. Sometimes contributors participated to a contest. For example, a contest for families. The contest uh, was during one month. And during that one month, the contest was about reducing as much as possible the waste that you produce as a family. And of course, when you create a game around that, you, you are encouraging people to, to do it and to, and to play that game, sure, of course. Uh, we did the same thing, a contest for companies, uh, in order to, and, and the, the topic of the contest was remote working, like home office, re working from, from home and uh, in order to see who is the company who is able to implement remote working the fastest possible. And of course, these things encourage people to participate. It's not, it's, it's not just about someone complaining or someone get, saying, this is the way it should be done. It's also about people suggesting new ways of, of doing things. That's one example. The second example that I wanted to use um, is something, an initiative that we called 15, 15 Places to Reinvent. 
And this is something that we talked about in Athens a couple of years ago. It was just an idea back then, and now it worked. So we had 15 places in the city. Some of them were just gardens that no one, no one used, no one took care of. Other places were buildings that we knew that they were going to be empty. So instead of doing it the old way, Joanna Roland always says that you do not build the city in 2019. Actually, she said, she said it in 2014. She, so she said, you don't build the city in 2014 like you used to do it 50 years ago or 30 years ago or even 20 years ago. You build the city today with the citizens. Co-creation, you use the word. So we had those 15 places. We could have, we could have played it the old way, the old-fashioned way like decide what to do in that building, what to do in that public space. But we preferred doing it the other way. We said, okay, people, we have these 15 places. Come and visit them. Visit, visit them, sorry. So they came, they visited them. Tell us which ideas you think are good to be implemented in those places, in each of those places. Once they said that, we said, okay, you have the ideas. Do you want to do it? Do you want to implement those ideas? Or is it just words? Some of them said, yes, I want to do it. Some of them were already in NGOs, so the, the NGO already existed. Some of them were not in NGOs, but they met during those days, and they started working together, they built the plan, they designed what the activity that was going to happen in that, in that place, and a few, a few months later, we asked the people of NOT to vote, so we had 7,000 voters. Of course, 7,000 on 300,000 is not that important, but it was the first time that we did it. So we had people having ideas, people building projects, some other people voting for which project should be given to which place, or at least the other way around, which place should be given to which project. And, 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 and in that way, we had very interesting things that happened. For example, we have, uh, we have a social restaurant that has been created. Uh, you come in and you pay whatever you want to pay. That's really interesting as a model. So they announce the costs and they ask people to pay whatever they can pay. Some people pay two, two euros others pay 20 euros, and the equilibrium is, like the balance is, is, is created like this. In, in one of the places, that was a place that used to be a, a restaurant that closed maybe 10 years ago. So, so you see, the, the idea is that it's not always top down, it's not always bottom up, sometimes it's somewhere in between, and it's the articulation of both that, that allows us to innovate. Um, of course, we have, we have, a, we have a smart city uh, initiatives, we have many things around technology, we have many things about the ecosystem, the economical ecosystem, but really innovation is about finding new solutions to new problems, and this is also applicable when it comes to democracy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Mr. Asse. It was very inspirational. I'm sure that there are many questions coming to your head. Does anyone want to throw the first question? And we have the throwing mic. Oh no, it's a walking mic. Ah, still. So please. Yeah, thanks. Um, if you can tell, you know, where you come from. I was trying to, but it's not. Is it working? Yeah. Okay, yeah? great. So Philip Patback from uh, Amsterdam, Free University. Thanks a lot to everyone. Super inspiring, particularly by the story I just heard. My question is, how can we make all European cities as innovative as yours? Because the question now is how we accelerate uh, the success stories and how we can really scale them up. And everyone has been saying this uh, this couple of past days, but I really still haven't heard the, the ideas, the breakthroughs. Maybe that's also where the research should be on. How can we facilitate fast learning because we have 10 to 15 years? So I would be really appreciating some of your ideas on this, how we can make this happen very fast. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take yeah. that question? Yeah, and others can, of course, so, reply if they want. So, so uh, uh, pretty sh as short as possible, actually, I, I can tell you how it worked for us. I'm not sure that it will work everywhere else, but it can give ideas, at least. So, first, it didn't happen by doing this. It took time. It started probably at the end of the 90s. We started doing that civic dialogue thing on some specific projects. At the beginning, small things, then things a bit more complex but it started on a project level. So that's the first thing. You need to install a culture, and the culture it doesn't happen like this. It takes time, efforts, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The second thing is that <laughs> it, it, it might sound a bit contradictory, but uh, if, the, if the person who is, uh, who is running a campaign, who is leading um, like a, a, a political campaign, is saying that this is the way things should be done. Once he is elected, he's, it's mandatory for him to do it. Otherwise, he will not be elected the second time, right? So, and if you have one leader who is saying this is the way to do things, and if he really applies it, 
So that's the mayor of Nantes. She, she did that in 2013 during the campaign. She won based on a few things, but also on that idea of participatory democracy. Once she said that, it means that all the deputy mayors, all the uh, city, uh, city council members went that way too. They were not going to say, you just got elected and you were wrong on your ideas. She just got elected. So she gave, the in, she gave the initial impulse, let's say, and once that is given, the other elected officials went that way. The civil servants, of course, went also that way. And the citizens at the beginning, they were a bit like, you know how it is. Citizens do not always trust the elected officials, right? Even if they vote for them. So there, there's a kind of mistrust that exists between, between the elites or the elected officials, etc. But at least you need to show them a few things that prove that you are not taking their time for nothing. They are not wasting their time with you. So small projects that show that things work when they participate, when they give ideas, small projects, but also more complex, more strategic projects, because you need them to be involved also in very strategic projects, like we do. Sometimes it's projects that get out of the ground in 10 years, but they need to participate now in order to design them and for the projects to, to, to get out of the ground in 10 years. So examples, the political uh, voluntarism, uh, how do you say that? Like the politician need to be showing the way and sincerely showing the way. And of course it takes time. Thank you, Ricardo. Do you want to add something to that? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add the idea that we should uh, learn from cases of success, but trying to scale up and replicate best practices is in my view the recipe for disaster in the sense that we need to understand the fundamental causes that are driving success, but then be able to understand the diversity of the different contexts, the, the huge diversity of European cities, of European regions. So, like Assem said, something might work, might not, might have worked in a particular context, might not work in another context. So I think it's very important to have the diagnostic tools that are needed to have the correct diagnosis of the local environment you are dealing with, so that you know what are the strengths, what are the opportunities available to your own city, given your own characteristics, and then see, okay, what might work. Having knowledge and understanding what worked in other cases uh, is extremely important. But we do need to understand what really works, in the sense, what are, what are the mechanisms, uh, what are the costs involved, because some cities might simply not be able to afford certain solutions. Therefore, there is uh, stock taking about what works and what doesn't. That is what in the report we call uh, the evaluation part of understanding how different experiments and work uh, and how. And then there is how to replicate those in different contexts. That is about understanding the context, having a detailed diagnosis that also involved local participation, and then see, okay, this might work given our context, and start as was suggested with small experimentation and see, does it work? Yes, no, under what condition, and then scale up. But scale up from within the context, not scale up from best practices. I think this is particularly important because we run the risk to have politicians say, okay, I want to go for large flagship projects because they increase my chances to be reelected. So I go for something that is very flashy that allows me to cut ribbons uh, when I get close to elections. But we don't want that. We really want something that is much more painful, that is learning by doing, it is learning by experimenting, and scaling up from within rather than from uh, at the outside. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, uh, because we only have five minutes until the end. So um, I, I think it's rather creating a movement, right? picking up by that. It's more creating the movement that these experiments are reasonable, that it's worth the effort, right? So I think it's a lot about communicating those cases, let other Cities, decision makers, politicians learn that it's really worth taking the sort of, of risk. So I tend more to see it as a movement that we need to create yes. by doing a lot of communication on that. Thank you, Margit. We have time for one more question. Is there another question? Oh, I will have to pick up. Maybe we can hear the two questions and maybe we can react, you know, in a <laughs> collective way. So maybe first, yeah, there. If you can introduce yourself, please. I don't think it works. Hey. Just shout, old fashioned. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Uh, Frédéric Xavier from the uh, um, United Nations Human Settlement Program. Um, 
I wanted to comment, I mean, I wanted to go back on the, the, the call made uh, by Professor Rutger on the issue of the governance of ur urban data. Uh, I fully subscribe uh, to, the, um, uh, to the expression of, uh, I mean, that uh, challenge that you've made. Um, and my question, I mean, I, th I believe this is a very new issue in the sense that before data were uh, controlled by the authority um, at the local level, like, for example, through making plans or statistics, this kind of thing. And we've seen that data suddenly uh, is escaping uh, uh, the control of public bodies. So my question would be how, I mean, first, I, we ag agree that this is indeed a challenge. It raises a number of important questions. But how can we think of a way to um, uh, build, rebuild the capacity uh, and also the legal uh, possibility for public authorities at the local and national level uh, to actually have some sort of uh, control on data. Thank you. Can we take, please, the second question is just behind you. Yeah. Uh, I am Juan, Juan Luis Moragas. Uh, I am a lawyer from Bilbao. and at, I am teaching at Deusto University too in public, public, uh, public uh, law. Um, <coughs> In my opinion, uh, there, there are uh, three methodological questions to, to take in account. First of all, the systemic, uh, the systemic, uh, the global system uh, methodologies to, to, to understand the problem, not only the linear thinking, but we need the uh, systemic thinking in uh, all of the works. Second one is that the public bodies are not the only public action because the, uh, the people and the, the, the little uh, entities, uh, cultural entities, sportive entities, and all of them are the public action too. It's very important this. And the third is, is the, the legal uh, framework. We need to to prepare to 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 to, to work uh, about the new legal framework, as in the Middle Ages, in the in the origin of the cities, we 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 work uh, able to 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 have a new rules for the innovation and for the sustainability. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, today. we'll have really to, to yeah, cut yeah, it because yeah, it's yeah. You know, too long as a question. I will ask Mr. Rutgers to you know, uh, react. Is that working? Yes, please. Thank you very much. The first question was uh, the question uh, how to control the data. It begins with the legal decision. The legal decision means uh, who has the sovereignty of data. And you know that there's a great, great debate in the scene of it is possible to decide how we here in the United Europe had to decide. We had said that uh, datas are, uh, the owner of the datas are the people who produced the datas. That means if you ask uh, what's happened with the community, uh, with the village, with the town, you have the possibility to work with your datas, but uh, you must say it to your people. Also for each people, what's happened with the data. And it's not possible that you work uh, with this uh, communal datas on the level of uh, uh, the energy um, um, uh, firm uh, the communal firm who makes energy or makes water, I think like this, they uh, buy uh, other data or they, they sold other data and things like this. My point, and that's a little point I will uh, um, mention. In my former life, before I was uh, in the parliament and uh, in the government uh, and uh, responsible for digitalization and uh, education and research and things like this, and before I was minister president, which means uh, uh, in one of our federal uh, states, 
I have the impression that we debate on the communal level things which I have learned the first time at the 17th of the last century. Uh, we discussed about uh, uh, things we know, we discussed about things we uh, have said uh, more than uh, 40 years, and we have not the power to change something. I had the, the, my second job was the same what uh, Mr. Basam Asse makes in, uh, in Nantes. If you wanted to change something in the system of communal, it is a hard work. That's the first point. The second point, we have now great challenges. We have heard this. One of the great challenges is digitalization. And not surely also climate problems, mobilization, immigration, and all these things. And if we wanted to have solutions for these things, that was the first question we heard, we must first have a relation to our own public, to our people who live. And um, I say it is right. It is not only voting one time for five years. It is to have a transparent administration and you must discuss each decision, each personal decision, also from the administration with the people who is invol involved on this. That's the first point. The second point, I believe it is necessary that we have a great social debate about the problem, what do we do with the immigrants? You must debate about what's happened with uh, the digitalization, the sovereignty on this point. What do you want to have there? And if we do it, and now I stick, we have no time, no, no, I say, if we don't do this, we will have the same problem we have in uh, France with, uh, with uh, the West, we have the problems with our uh, populist parties, our uh, radical parties, our anti semitic parties. That's the point which is necessarily discussed. It's not a, uh, the, the problem to organize a little bit more uh, our administration in the towns. Thank you. much. Um, now it's time uh, to, to close this very interesting session. A round of applause for the panel.